Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I was here in 2015 at the Oxford Africa Conference to speak on the topic, Africa, a continent on the move, people, politics, and business across borders. That opportunity four years ago to actively engage a broad range of stakeholders was mutually beneficial. A few of my compatriots have had the honor, as I stated in 2015, of being trained in this prestigious institution of learning. Professor Kofi Abrifabuzia, former Prime Minister of Ghana, the former President John Ajikum Kufo, one of my predecessors, a legal luminary, Mr. Chachu Chikata, and a governance expert and university lecturer, Professor Kwamina Ahoy. I do not have such a distinguished opportunity, but I can assure you I received a reasonably good education from Ghana's premier university, the University of Ghana at Legon, of which I'm very proud. I thank you for the opportunity to be back here again at Oxford. I'd like to pay a few acknowledgments to Mr. Ian Rogan, the MBA director, Mr. Wale Adebanwi, Director of African Studies Center, and Tammy Brophy, Chair of African Alliance at the Said Business School. I want to thank you for the collaboration and invitation to share my thoughts on democracy and elections in contemporary Africa. As a historian, the temptation is great for me to begin my exposition from the theories on the state of nature by the great thinkers Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau as they apply to the social contract and the beginnings of governance in human society. But such a venture will require the whole day to accomplish. In my allotted time of 30 minutes, I'll carry out a brief discourse on current developments in respect of democracy and elections in Africa, and hope to have the opportunity to expatiate more in the question and answer session. Democracy, ladies and gentlemen, is an antithesis of dictatorship authoritarianism, tyranny, or despotism. Democracy is a system that promotes the participation of the citizens in how they are governed. It reposes sovereignty in the people on whose behalf leadership is exercised. It is based on the rule of law, respect for rights, and freedoms of citizens. Elections are an instrument for exercising choice of the people on who occupies an office of leadership. Elections are therefore an exercise of the people's right of choice as to who their leaders at various levels of governance should be, often for a period defined by law. But no, make no mistake, elections are conducted as well under authoritarian regimes. However, the system of elections under such circumstances are rigged to achieve a predetermined outcome. Democracy allows an environment that promotes creativity and innovation. People will always make a choice for a system of government that allows them to express themselves freely and be able to have a say in how they are governed. Africa has experimented with different systems of government since gaining political independence from colonial rule. But three main areas can be distinguished. The immediate post-independence era of one-party rule, the era of military dictatorships, and from the turn of the millennium, what one may call the era of African Democratic Spring. This period, the African Democratic Spring, saw a blossoming of constitutional rule and democratic gov governments across the continent. From the early 1990s, as a result of pressure from their own citizens, civil society organizations, external actors, and the general global environment, many African countries began to open up and return to constitutional democracy. Constitutional rule replaced military dictatorships. Elections became the norm rather than the exception. Respect for human rights and freedoms, an expanded media space, all became the trend to follow. Even pseudo-democracies, which still had autocratic leaderships, were forced to join the train and allowed elections to take place. That's often, that often turned out results as high as 95% endorsements of the regime in question. 
Recent events, however, reveal that citizens have the ability and the will to force democratic change. Little sparks can trigger a chain of events that end up dislodging even the most entrenched dictator. When the people have suffered enough, cowardly citizens who earlier fled at the least sign of the heavy hand of repression become so outraged, they embrace death and injury as a worthy sacrifice in the confrontation with dictatorship. Removal of subsidies last December shot up the price of bread, a staple food item in Sudan. Spontaneous protests began in Adbara and quickly spread across the country. As the protests continued, the protesters gained strength in numbers, and not even the brutality of the security services could douse the fire that had been lit. A similar fire was lit in Algeria when the ailing president announced that he was going to run for a fifth term in office. Spontaneous protests erupted, leading to a collapse of the regime. Earlier in the Arab Spring, uprisings of the people swept strong men, Ben Ali, Hosni Mubarak, and Muammar Gaddafi out of power. In Gambia, strong man Yaya Jame eventually had to go into exile, following initial attempts to challenge the results of an election that had given victory to his opponent, Adama Barrow. To consolidate democratic development in Africa, the continental body, the African Union, in its attempt to capture the will and desire of the people, provided a robust normative structure to guide member states. In its mission of democracy promotion, the AU built an expansive framework and adopted protocols, mechanisms, and institutions for implementation. These mechanisms and institutions have been instrumental in strengthening democratic governance in the AU member states and have aided those in transition from conflict and authoritarian regimes. This is a departure from the predecessor Organization of African Unity, which had a charter in 1963 embracing the doctrine of non-interference in the internal affairs of member states. Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, the AU Constitutive Act embraces a new doctrine of non-indifference to human rights abuses within the territory of another AU member state. The Act and the 2007 African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance are the continental body's framework for the protection and promotion of democracy. Cumulatively, these tools have emboldened the AU in its democracy, promotion and good governance agenda. The democratic spring in Africa has impacted positively on many African countries. Over the last decade, average GDP growth in many countries has ranged between 4 and 6 percent. Many countries have seen an upsurge in foreign direct investments. Africa has enjoyed the fastest growth in telecommunications and information technology during this period. The African middle class has prospered and has been one of the fastest growing in the world. Per capita income has increased significantly for many African states. The successful implementation of the Millennium Development Goals has seen the achievements of reduction of extreme hunger and malnutrition. Many African countries have seen an increase in primary school enrollment and also the achievement of gender parity in enrollment. Average life expectancy has improved. Widespread use of vaccinations has seen a significant drop in under five mortality, and many children are surviving and thriving. All these positive developments are the dividends of democracy. As a chairman of the Tana High Level Forum on Security in Africa, I had the privilege last week in Bahada, Ethiopia, to present a summary of the report on the state of peace and security in Africa in 2018. The report noted some successes achieved by Africans in the quest for peace and good governance in that year. The report noted the holding of elections in 27 countries and the successful transfer of power. It noted an expansion of space for civil society engagement despite the considerable risks the operators face. The report also noted the growing involvement of young people braving the odds stacked against them in the political space to join politics, seek elective positions in parliament or in public office. 
The youth were also taking advantage of the digital revolution to put developmental issues of concern to them on the front burner of national, continental, and global agenda. As game changers in many respects, youth activism and visa liberalization are making the free movement of people, goods, and services across the continent easier. They are in turn producing impulses capable of improving regional integration and cross-border trade and also significantly contributing to overall GDP growth. The year 2018 also saw all but three African countries meet and sign the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which recently achieved the record threshold of the 22 ratifications required for coming into effect. All the above indicate significant strides towards political and economic liberation of the people in Africa and paint a picture of a continent definitely on course in delivering on the will of the people. Ladies and gentlemen, for example, if this free trade agreement is faithfully implemented and the arithmetic works out as planned, it may just be what the continent needs to set itself on the pathway towards achieving the African Union Agenda 2063, which is an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa. This prospect is achievable, and the signals are positive. Notwithstanding the significant gains made, African democracy is still fragile and faces many challenges. The dividends of democracy are still not immediately tangible to the African population. Major inequality exists and the fruits of economic growth are not shared fairly down the class chain. Many vulnerable groups are losing out while the affluence of the growing prosperous classes is being flaunted in their faces. Social safety nets have not been enough to stem the growing divide between the rich and the poor. Citizens begin to question the need to exercise their franchise during elections when they feel no tangible improvement in their lives. This could commonly be referred as democracy fatigue. Africa is a continent in a hurry. Africa does not have the luxury of time if democracy must thrive. Former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Hail Mariam de Salim, said democracy is not all about elections. He was right. Democracy is about improvement in people's lives. It is about access to social services. It is about jobs and employment. It is about social justice and the fight against corruption. It is about the establishment of strong institutions. Africa has a burgeoning population Economic growth is not translating into jobs as fast as is necessary to keep up with population growth. It is estimated that about 12 million graduates are churned out every year from tertiary institutions in Africa. And yes, less than 5 million sustainable job places are available for them each year. African nations need to accelerate growth and ensure there's a greater diffusion of the fruits of growth down the class chain. While democracy, elections, free speech, and a vibrant media are the greatest assets in the fight against graft and corruption, perceptions of corruption can heighten in a democracy because there's increased open discussion of acts of malfeasance that create an impression that the canker is on the increase. This heightened perception of corruption added to the fact that the wheels of justice in a democracy grind very slowly, often lead to a sense of longing for the unconstitutional times when persons suspected of corruption could be dealt with without any regard to their respect for their human rights. Low participation of women in elective office due to social cultural factors continue to be an indictment on Africa's democratic development. In most countries, women form the majority of the population and yet are severely underrepresented in elective and public office. In my own country, Ghana, while women form about 51% of the population, the majority, the highest percentage of seats held by women in our parliament is 12.7% in the 2017 parliament. And this is up from 10.9% in the 2013 parliament. In many countries also, the lack of effective decentralization of power and resources means that development is lopsided and many geographic areas find themselves marginalized and deprived. 
This creates fertile grounds for all kinds of social agitation and dissension, and in extreme cases, insurgency. Decentralization and a fair redistribution of wealth are the most effective guarantees for stability and security in a democracy. Democratic governments must therefore go hand in hand with political and economic empowerment of local populations. Lack of continuity in planning and development because of frequent transfers of power could also hobble investment and development, especially in situations where incoming administrations renege on fulfilling agreements on, and obligations entered into by its predecessor. Other areas of challenges in electoral systems exist, and we need to look at that uh, considering their implication for democracy. The increased use of IT in elections has become topical. The use of IT in resource transmission and the possibility of hacking have created new fears about the manipulation of results. Examples of this can be found in the recent elections in Ghana, Kenya, and Sierra Leone. During the last presidential election in Ghana, the Electoral Commission directed its staff to stop using the electronic transmission system to communicate results to the tallying center because the system had been compromised. The result had to therefore be tallied manually, leading to attendant tensions in the delay of the announcement of the final results. As I speak, I'm not aware that the Electoral Commission has carried out any investigation into what compromised their IT system. And even if they have, we, the stakeholders, the political parties, have not been briefed on what caused the corruption of the system. In the interest of transparency, it is important for Ghanaians to understand what happened before we go into another election. In Kenya, I was impressed at the sophistication of the Kenya Integrated Election Management System a system which sought to transmit results, election results directly from the polling center to the front end server of the Kenyan Electoral Commission. The same equipment that served to verify voters was the same device for entering the tally after voting and transmitting the results. On the day, this system became the bone of contention and created such tension that it threatened the stability of Kenya's democracy. In the end, good sense prevailed. As we advised, Raila Odinga, the opposition candidate, filed a motion in court claiming that the Kenyan integrated electoral management system had been manipulated by the insertion of some algorithms to alter the results in favor of the incumbent. The hearing at the Kenyan Supreme Court favored Mr. Odinga, and a rerun was ordered. Of course, Mr. Odinga's decision to withdraw from the rerun made it a one-horse race, giving victory to President Kenyatta. In Sierra Leone, after no candidate secured enough votes to claim a first round victory, a runoff was organized between the two leading contenders. In a 10 second round election, election crisis was sparked when during the, uh, the counting, the incumbent government candidate claimed that the opposition had conspired with the Electoral Commission to rig the tallying system in its favor. Of course, this created a tense standoff. They demanded a scrapping of the EC's electronic system and its replacement with simple Excel spreadsheets. It shows how complicated technology can create disputes. In the end, we, the observers, 10 mediators, advised to have a parallel spreadsheet tabulation done alongside the electronic tallying system and, of course, the snail pace manual transmission so that at the end of the process, a comprising could be made of all the results and give assurance to everybody that they had been treated fairly. To the relief of a lynching sitting on tenterhooks, results were announced with victory going to the opposition candidate. We huddled recently in Abiyokuta at the Obasanjo Presidential Library with political leaders, electoral officials, IT experts, and of course, hackers. We had hackers in attendance to discuss the use of IT systems in elections and how to avoid election disputes arising out of their use. Happily, I'm pleased to announce that the ECOWAS has taken up the challenge from there and is set to organize an in-depth discussion with all stakeholders in West Africa on the use of electronic systems in elections. Ladies and gentlemen, the rise of the new media has a significant impact on uh, Africa's democracy. 
and the choices made by our people. The use of bots, avatars, and trolling factories allow various interest groups to influence the decision of the people in elections. Indeed, this is not restricted to only African countries. Even advanced countries like the USA appear to be vulnerable, as the Muela report is revealing. Reports on the activities of Cambridge Analytica in the last US elections are also worthy of note. Unfortunately, activities of specialized organizations offering election manipulation services have become commonplace in Africa too. As new media overtakes the traditional mainstream media as the main source of choice for information that influences voter decisions, the role of such organizations is going to become even more crucial. It has become an occupational hazard for persons in public office to have their reputation sullied by anonymous online portals and troll factories. The pervasiveness and persistence of these fake news trolls makes them difficult to effectively respond to. Their anonymity also takes away any possibility of legal recourse. Africa is a diverse continent with many ethnicities confined into common political boundaries. The role of the underlying law of the land and political leadership must, to, must be to include rather to, than to exclude. Ethnic bigotry is therefore a threat to African democracy. Democracy must seek to include and not exclude. Any overt or covert activity, speech or action that seeks to exclude any part of a national population from fair participation in governance is subversive of democracy. And that is why comments by a senior public official in my country that national leadership should be the preserve for only those from resource-rich regions of Ghana must be condemned by all well-meaning Ghanaians. Insurgency in the Sahel and Savannah are also a growing threat to African democracies, especially in West Africa. Terrorist groups that are determined to disrupt democratic society are increasing activity in the Sahel and Savannah regions of Africa. Democracy cannot thrive in insecurity. Urgent collective action is needed to quell this threat. Already disturbing terrorist activity in Nigeria, Chad, Mali, Niger, Cameroon, Burkina Faso, and Cote d'Ivoire have the potential of spread, spreading and undermining our flourishing democracies. All in all, I would say African democracy is blossoming. It needs to be nurtured. It needs to be consolidated. Africans must accept our new democracies as a way of life. We must create societies that are free, but also disciplined and orderly. Our democracies must seek to create a decent life for our people in a clean environment that works to preserve our planet. In this endeavor, we must all be committed to play our parts. It is only in this way that we can unleash the full potential of our people to create a better society for generations to follow. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, for your excellent speech. Um, you identified some fundamental problems that African democracies uh, face. Um, and at the same time, you concluded by saying that democracy is blossoming in Africa. Are you therefore dismissing those who um, are arguing that uh, the question of democracy is not settled in Africa yet? Well, um, the point I'm making is that we must recognize the successes we have achieved. It is only when you recognize your successes that you can build on it. Um, we have the question of the glass is half full or is half empty. If you see it as half full, then it's easier to fill the glass. If you see it as half empty, then it's more difficult to fill the glass. And so I think that despite the fact that we face major challenges, which I have outlined in terms of our electoral systems, in terms of you know, inequality in distribution of the fruits of growth, in terms of poor decentralization, I mentioned all those things, we still must count our blessings and the successes we have so that it makes it easier for us uh, to build on it. Okay. One of the major uh, challenges to democracy in Africa is the level of poverty in the continent. Um, and related to that is uh, what one herent politician in Nigeria described as uh, stomach infrastructure. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with this, what it means is that you know, uh, electorate, uh, 
expect politicians to give them money, food, you know, rather than, you know, I mean, build roads and all of that, that if you don't give people money, you know, you would actually, you have not actually served their purpose. That's what one of them described as stomach in, in infrastructure. Um, and given your own experience in Ghana, I'm familiar with, the, you know, some of the criticism of your time in power that you were, you know, building roads or hospital, new airport, but you weren't providing stomach infrastructure. I don't think they used that <laughs> phrase in Ghana. So, um, what, what, how would you describe this major challenge in African democracies that, you know, because of poverty, because of attitude, people actually expect that politicians should provide, you know, money, food and all of that, you know, to be able to uh, encourage people to support them for office? I believe that if Africa must uh, grow and create a prosperous and decent existence for its people, it must start by putting in the basic social and economic infrastructure. I believe that the all-round development of people is based on having a good quality educational system, is based on having a good health system, is based on having a good roads that make it easy to transport goods and people across the country, is based on providing them with clean drinking water, is based on providing them with electricity. These are all things that help develop the human person. But as you said, um, when they say stockmark infrastructure, it means forget about the socioeconomic infrastructure, build the infrastructure in my stomach. And I faced that um, uh, situation when I was president. We embarked on a quite aggressive rollout of infrastructure in all the sectors. And um, in many places that I went to campaign um, during the election, the last election, People told me they don't eat roads, or they don't eat hospitals, and that they eat food, and they want money in their pockets, you know. And so it is, it, it is something that has been encouraged over the years by politicians handing out, you know, cash gifts and things to, to people, such that they don't realize that the overall development of their human person is better guaranteed with the availability of social and economic infrastructure than the handouts that you give them. I mean, there's a saying, teach me how to fish and not give me fish. And so, yes, during elections, people come and distribute fish to you. But after the elections, what, 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 do, you eat? what do you eat? If you're sick, which hospital do you go to? And so we mustn't give up. We must persist. I believe that robust social infrastructure rollout is beneficial. One, in terms of even job creation, we estimate that in the uh, infrastructure that we're building, we're building 200 new secondary schools to expand access to secondary education in our country because we realized that the 500 and something schools that we had were congested and could not contain all the children. And so a lot of children didn't go to secondary school just because there was not enough space for them. And so we undertook to build 200 new schools so that all children who wanted a secondary education could get one. We undertook to build a hospital in every district so that people didn't have to travel more than a certain distance to reach a good health facility. I think this is the way to go and we must persist. It also created jobs in all the infrastructure that we were rolling out. We estimate that, estimate that we created about 400,000 jobs for masons, engineers, carpenters, steel benders, even the women who sell food at the sites to the workers you know, earn an income to take back and feed their family. And so that's the multiplier effect that, you know, rolling out infrastructure has. And so we'll persist in building social and economic infrastructure, not in people's stomachs, but in the country to ensure uh, prosperity and development. Okay, there, there has been um, an upsurge in political violence in Ghana with uh, the recent appearance of talks, you know, called vigilantes. And, and at the point you even lost your cool and threatened, you know, your opponents, uh, of violence for violence. Uh, you used to be known as a man of peace. What happened? <laughs> I just explained briefly. Um, over the years, from 1992, when we returned to the Fourth Republican Democracy and started elections, political parties have had, you know, um, some kind of people who provide security, you know, for the parties. These used to be called macho men. And really, I mean, all they did was go to the gym and pump and build biceps and muscles and intimidate, you know, people and all that. But, I mean, when they crossed the line, the police rounded them up, went and locked them. 
in, in, in custody until after election, the counting was over, and then they'll release them to go. These were small misdemeanors. But sometime from 2015 to 2016, we noticed that one political party had brought people to train these macho men, you know, in martial arts, in um, weapons handling, and other very, they were, they, were, they were turning from macho men into something like militias. And so it, cre it created a disturbing uh, trend, and it all crystallized in what happened in a by-election called, in a constituency called Ayawasu West Wagon. Uh, there was a suspicion that arms or something were in the house of the opposition parliamentary candidate. And so well-armed um, uh, militia people, they claimed that they were from the SWAT unit of the police, you know, stormed the house ostensibly to search for weapons. Of course, they were resisted by the bodyguards of the uh, MP. And um, they opened fire. People were injured. And um, it raised the issue of these vigilantes or militias. And um, since then, there's been a commission of inquiry which has come out with its report. The government has to issue a white paper on it. It hasn't done so yet. Um, there's also a meeting of the Peace Council by the major political parties to see how these vigilante groups can be disbanded and uh, to create a peaceful environment for elections. But the main concern of the opposition parties is that the, main, the government party has absorbed a lot of these their militias into the security services. And so they are in the police, they are in the army, they are in national security. And so even if you disbanded you know, the, uh, mil the militias, what do you do with those who have already been absorbed into the security services? And couldn't they be used to create mayhem you know, when elections come? So these are questions that we're dealing with. But I'm hopeful that um, uh, with, with level-headedness, head, we can achieve you know, a peaceful outcome and have peaceful elections in 2020. So you're still in I, 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 I was shocked by what I saw. I saw the videos of I also West Wagon, and I saw the masked men. They were in masks. And when we asked at the Commission of Inquiry, the one who was commanding them said, oh, they wore the mask to prevent mosquito bites. I mean, can you imagine that? <laughs> So the shock of seeing what happened there, you know, of course, I mean, when you speak uh, and, and, you're, and you're emotionally charged, you know, I said that we're going to match them boot, boot for boot, you know, but everybody knows my disposition. And so I'd rather have a peaceful outcome than. Yes, you, you have been in government for, before you left as president for a long time. You were in the parliament, you were vice president, you were president. So I have two questions. First, how is life outside power? It's, it's great. And uh, Wale, it's great. <laughs> and uh, why do you want to return to office? I've spent, I've spent more than 20 years in public office. And um, I started as a deputy minister, a minister, member of parliament for three terms, vice president, president. Of course, I served one term as president. And um, I, after I lost, I started to engage in um, activities of democratic consolidation. Uh, speaking about my time in office and all that. And it's been a fantastic period. I had hoped that my party would select somebody else. But um, try as I did, I mean, the insistence was that I should run again. I believe in public service. I believe that if you have the talent and you have the ability, you must always place your talent at the disposal of your nation. And so I didn't think it was right to deprive my party of my services if they actually wanted it. And so the party said, okay, you participate in the primaries. We held a presidential primary and there were seven uh, of us contesting. And of course, the party came back with a resounding endorsement, 95.24% for me to run. And so I, I took up the challenge and um, I hope that we will go into the elections. We expect they should be free and fair. And whatever I can give off to my country again for one final term, I'll do so. But beyond that, it's mostly nice to be Beyond that, I'll continue to work for my country. I'll continue to work for Africa. But I'm saying it, it must be nice to be president. Isn't no, it? it's stressful. If you really... <laughs> I'm serious. If you, really, if you really come to the presidency to work, you don't get a, day's, a, a night's sleep. My hair was jet black. I mean, this is... <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, so I'm looking forward to spending time with my family, you know, a more easy life. I, I'm a very private person. I like my privacy, but once you get into office, I mean, all the protocol, I don't like protocol, too much protocol. All the protocol, where you must sit, where you must pass, security and all that, it's, it can be a bit stressful. Okay. One last question before I turn it to the audience. Uh, you mentioned meeting hackers in the meeting in Abel Kuta. Yes. What, what was your... Did you have some discussions with them? <laughs> we did. Okay. It was a very, very eye-opening experience for me. Um, we were discussing the use of IT in elections and the disputes that had begun to emerge as a result of um, the IT, use of IT. And so President Obasanjo, I had a discussion with him and he said, ah, why don't we hold you know, a forum? I'll host it in my presidential library. And so he sent the invitation and I went. And he had IT experts, he had people from electoral commissions. Myself and um, Raila Odinga uh, were there. Raila was the candidate in Kenya when I went to observe the elections, he was there. And there were two hackers they actually said, these are hackers. They had certificates in hacking. <laughs> and they showed how IT systems could be compromised. And they took us through a lot that, I mean, I, I didn't know existed. But it is real. It is real that they're able to hack into a system and be able to bring it down or to extract whatever they want out of it or to achieve whatever outcome they want out of it. And so they also showed us uh, how security of IT systems should be perfected so that they are not able to hack into it, you know. And so it was eye-opening, and then um, President Obasanjo spoke to the ECOWAS. So the ECOWAS is elevating the discussion to a sub-regional level, and they're going to bring people from electoral um, commissions across the West African sub-region and then bring some of these people and, you know, have a discussion at that level and see how we can make our IT systems for elections more secure so that these little disputes that are beginning to emerge can be eliminated. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. I will now turn it to the audience. We will take a set of three questions uh, first. And please, can you mention your name and if you have an affiliation that is relevant and then uh, we'll take uh, those first three questions. Where is the microphone? Okay. All right. Can we start uh, from there? Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Osoe Chang. I'm a Deputy Communication Officer for NDC UK and Ireland. My question is, during the 2016 elections, the former <coughs> EC boss did a um, um, press conference that the Electoral Commission website had been hacked. I'm taking you back to the US. The same thing happened in the US in this, um, 2016 elections. Now, Mr. President, is there anything that the government, the current government, can talk about this, um, the Electoral Commission EC uh, website, especially the national security? As I'm talking to you now, the same elections has been gazetted and the former EC board was removed. What are you doing about this situation? Because we have been talking about hacking, 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 hacking. So 2020 elections, what are we going to do about it? Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, can I take the question um, here? Well, down here. My name is Azamati. I read for the MFAO International Relations. Mr. President, if history has any lesson to teach us, it is that we learn from our past mistakes. Those who say democracy is good for us, in the past, were never democratic in their first 60 to 70 years. They have supported and continue to support autocratic regimes, for example, Saudi Arabia, to suppress its own citizens. In their own history, they were not democratic, as I said early on. But when they became democratic, they said everybody should should be, should be a democratic country after they had developed. Is, democratic, is democracy an outcome of development or is a prelude to development? And finally, Mr. President, if I remember your speech correctly, you made a line which was like, the, the development of an individual's well-being and the welfare of citizens is always important. If it is so important, how on earth 
should African countries spend huge sums of money rerunning elections whilst the people we look up to, like the United States and Great Britain, do never rerun elections. For example, in the 2016 elections, it was clear that um, Hillary Clinton has, had won the elections, but there was an electoral college. 509 people determined the life and political life of 120 million Americans. Why can't we learn from those who claim democracy is good and do what is best for us? Mm. Thank you. One more uh, <laughs> question. No, we'll come to this side. Can we have uh, a guy in the sweater? Thank you very much. My name is Alexander Dufo, a DPhil student in the School of Geography and the Environment. Uh, Mr. President, um, you mentioned a number of things that are, as it were, challenges to the democracy in Africa and Ghana. You mentioned ethnicity. You mentioned um, recently IT. It seemed to me, though, that um, before these, especially IT, we had always had these problems with our democracy. Recently, I was listening to one of the clergymen, renowned clergymen in Ghana, the Archbishop Duncan Williams, who had suggested that he's afraid of the rising, as it were, discontent within the youth because they see their compatriots who enter into politics and within a very short time they are as it were doing well you know um riding the porsche cars and, and the rest of them now he suggests that we probably as a country should have a coalition group and then decide that probably for 20 25 years we are not going to have, as it were, a presidential elections. We could have parliamentary elections. And then define developmental goals for ourselves. And rotate, have a system of probably rotating the presidency within this coalition. I want to find your thoughts, especially against the backdrop of the question that he posed whether the sort of democracy, this electoral system that you have mentioned some of the problems that we are having is necessarily good for us, especially with the growing gap between you know, the it's elites the and then the masses. And then what's your thought about the four-year term that we have in Ghana? Um, your predecessor, President Kufo, suggested at the, on, the, on, on the eve of his exit that we probably should be thinking about five years okay. or six years. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts? Thanks. Okay. All right, let me take these three and then uh, we'll, we'll probably go another round. Um, yes, I, I said in my speech that the um, um, electoral commissioner announced some time after the vote count that the EC's IT system had been compromised. And I stated that I'm not aware that they have investigated why it got compromised. And at least if they have, they haven't shared those findings with us. And I said that it was important for us to find out, you know, what had happened so that we forestall any uh, dispute around the IT system uh, in the next election, 2020. And so um, if the EC commissioner is listening to me, um, I think that... If they have investigated, they should let us know, you know, what compromised the system and what steps are being taken to safeguard uh, the system being compromised again. Um, as far as I'm aware, the absolute results of the presidential elections have been gazetted. But my understanding is that the breakdown by constitu constituencies and polling stations has not been done. We need that to be able to analyze the results in order that we can prepare for the next election. And so we'll urge the EC to gazette the results in totality as quickly as possible so that we have access to it. Um, it's an argument that has continued about autocratic systems and democratic systems. And um, a lot of the time, people point to Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore, who was an autocrat. 
but a benevolent dictator who moved his country progressively. And so people have the argument that we need a benevolent dictator. You know, people point at Rwanda and say, look, even though freedoms are curtailed, Rwanda is making progress, you know. It depends on how you look at it. I believe that democracies can also make progress. And the progress made in democracies are more sustainable because they are achieved by an interaction of all the people, not because one person says, this is good for you. And so if you look at even our history, I mean, we had autocratic regimes. We had military dictatorships from 1966 until 1992. What progress did we make? I mean, there were times in the 70s when Ghana hit rock bottom under a military dictatorship. And there was the proverbial you know, joke in Nigeria about a quiz master who asked in which country the queue for toilet roll. And the guy said, Ghana, he says, correct, for six points. I mean, we had gone so deep, we couldn't dig further. And so the only way to uh, move was to start coming up. And so we've experienced dictatorships. We've experienced uh, democracy. Ghana has made more progress from 1992 to date than uh, we have done in our previous existence. The economy has grown bigger, people's lives have improved, life expectancy has improved under these same democratic systems than we did under authoritarian regimes. And so I am a Democrat and I believe that the system can work. It's just that we must have a commitment to it and we must strengthen the institutions. People are discouraged because the institutions are weak. And so they don't, when you expect, let's say, the judiciary to perform its duty without fear or favor. You find that there's some political manipulation and all that kind of thing. That is what we should be fighting against. And one of the safeguards is to have a free, vibrant, and strong media. To have strong civil society organizations that are free to speak up when things are going bad in society. Unfortunately, sometimes um, the CEO, C CSOs go dumb, uh, dumb because uh, probably the political dispensation is one that they support, their political C CSOs and all that. But I guess that the progress of the country is the concern of all of us. And so all of us, no, must, must, all of us must ensure that that happens. Um, with regards to the same question about democratic uh, systems and what system we should adopt, Ghana is using a presidential system. We call it a bit of a hybrid because um, members, majority of the ministers in the executive must come from parliament. And so there's, that, there's not that strict separation of the executive and parliament. People have advocated that if you are appointed a minister, you must abdicate your seat and you know, have a by-election so that there'll be a strict separation between parliament and uh, uh, the executive. I support that. Because I think that Parliament has responsibility of oversight on the executive. And normally when you have this incestuous relationship between the executive and Parliament, then that um, uh, oversight role is compromised. Right now, everybody in Parliament wants to be appointed a, mini a minister. And so they know the executive is looking at you. If you um, oppose the executive or you don't do the exec executive's bidding, your chances of becoming a minister or deputy minister are zero. Mm -hmm. And so if there is a motion you don't agree with, you still have to vote for it because Big Brother is watching you. And uh, you know, so I think that we must separate the executive and, and parliament. If you run for parliament, be a member of parliament. If you're appointed by the executive because they think you're suitable to be a minister, abdicate your seats and let somebody uh, run for it and do that parliamentary duty. Um, a, a system of consensus building. There are parliamentary systems and uh, presidential systems. There are systems where if a by-election, an election is called, the government can be dissolved. And once you run the election again, the party that uh, has the biggest number enters into coalition with others. People believe that that is a good system because it leads to consensus building. And all manner of parties with different ideologies must come together to be able to get the majority in parliament to form the government. Um, it has its advantages. The presidential system too has its advantages. Um, our constitution drafters, you know, uh, gave us the pres uh, presidential system. If it's something that we need a national discourse on, we should do it and determine if we must amend the constitution or whatever. But I think that so far our constitution has worked for us. Ghana has made progress. We just need, you know, um, um, to to 
we just need to tweak things and make sure that institutions are working and are strong and that people who abdicate their responsibility or are engaged in malfeasance are punished, you know, not after the regime has left uh, government, but during the period of the regime. We tried to do that. There were scandals that came up while we were in government, and I told the investigative agencies to go ahead and investigate them, and if people were found to have involved themselves in any malfeasance, to be punished. And so we need to continue doing that. We must not get tired. We must keep fighting. I believe that all these countries that reach where they are, they not have it easy. And so we cannot expect that we'll just have an easy ride, you know, into development. We just have to persevere. Okay. Can we take another side? And then for four-year term, okay. I believe, I agree with President Kufu. I think a five-year term is better. <laughs> First year, you are elected, you're forming your government. Before you have settled uh, in, you are in your second year, third year, fourth year, you're fighting an election. So essentially, you have just two years to, to, to work, and it makes it difficult. Okay. Can we have uh, the lady at the back? Thank you very much. Um, Mr. President, thank you. Um, my name's Heather Maggs. I'm a PhD student at Reading University. And in December, I caught a bus from Wa to Navrongo. Um, the, on the grand scheme of things, this is a very, very small detail, but I promised the friends I was with who were helping me with my PhD that if I ever got this opportunity, I would ask if the infrastructure of the road from Wa to Navrongo could possibly be bumped up <laughs> the list. <laughs> and I, I never thought I would ever have this opportunity to. Uh, so I'm sorry for my friends in Ghana. Yes. I have to ask this question. Thank you very much. Thank sir. you. <laughs> Thank you, Your Excellency. My name is Arum Ote, and I'm an executive in residence uh, at the Said Business School uh, and an academic scholar at the Africa Center and St. Anthony's College. Uh, I have three questions, and I'll mm. make them quick. Mm. Uh, the, the two of them are not personal, and one is uh, personal. So I'll start with the one that's the least personal. Uh, you talked at the beginning of your speech about the transition in the charter for the African Union about intervening uh, into states. And you gave the example of what happened with the Gambia, yeah. which uh, you were involved in personally. Uh, and uh, I think all of you used the African way to try and encourage uh, the then president to exit power. But it didn't work. Um, but I'm a bit more focused on what's happening in Venezuela mm. and some of your views about it, because it's almost like a halfway house. The international community is there but not there. What is your opinion and what is it, you know, from your experience um, that you feel should be the way that the international community should respond in terms of being a good neighbor but not taking over the house? Mm. The second question I have relates to the power of incumbency and the cost of elections, which was some of what was coming out of the earlier question. So um, you are one of the leaders that was um, seem to have accepted uh, not to contest um, the elections or the result of the elections. Uh, and what I found is where the leader, it's unusual to have leaders who don't contest the, the, the elections. So how do you see the power of incumbency mm -hmm. and the cost of elections, particularly mm -hmm. for, an, for an outsider? Okay. And the personal one is what would you do differently uh, mm -hmm. if you got elected? Now you've had some time to reflect. Yeah. Uh, on uh, the, the last time that you were president. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can we have uh, the lady in front here? Uh, at the back, rather. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Moji Abasa, an alumni of uh, Weekly Fall, Oxford University. Um, I see you've got a very strong relationship with Nigeria, which is the biggest democracy in Africa. I'd really like to have your candid opinion about the recent presidential election, uh, which was canceled, I think, less than 24 hours to the actual date, which they had four years to plan for. Uh, the terrible violence, uh, the killings. Um, just to have your thoughts on okay. that. Okay, um, the guy at the back, please. Yes. Oh. The Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, I have two questions. Um, my name is Yao, and I'm a lecturer with the University of Reading. Uh, so the first question is your thoughts on the winner-takes-all um, um, situation uh, that is quite common in a lot of African countries and how that threatens democracy. 
And the second bit is you also highlighted the uh, importance or the role that the media plays in, in our democratic consolidation. Um, following uh, events in Ghana in recent times, I've noticed a section of the people talking about Ghana going back to the dark days, where there's a culture of uh, silence in the media. Um, what are your thoughts on Ghana's current situation, and how do you think that threatens the democracy of Ghana going forward? Okay. Can you please and the uh, yes, okay. lady, yes. Oh, hello. Um, my name is Beatrice Asante. I'm the North London chairperson in this country. With me, um, I think my issue is more to do with accountability, that when governments come in, no matter what anybody does, they always keep saying they're doing things through, they're going through a process, and nothing happens. People take money and they get away with it. And secondly, uh, um, continuity. When things are done, the hospitals are built, when roads are done, when um, other governments come, they don't actually continue what happens. And I find that, that that's wastage of money. And secondly, we've got electricity, we've got sun in Ghana. In this country, they don't have that much sun, but they use the solar energy. Why do we waste so much money on getting um, other things into the country whereby we can use our natural resources? Okay. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. All right. Um, let me take it quickly. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll start with one of Rongo Road. <laughs> <laughs> um, that road connects um, the capital of two regions of Ghana, the Upper West region and the Upper East region. And um, it's been in a bad shape for a long time. Uh, during my time, we started engineering the road. There was a major bridge that we needed to put as vice president at the time. We built the bridge so that it uh, improved the connection between the two regions. And then we started the process of engineering the road and putting a bituminous surface on it. Work was ongoing when we left office. My understanding is that that work has come to a standstill. And it links to the question she, she gave, that when a new government comes, projects that were initiated by the previous ones are abandoned. And then, of course, the new government has its own priorities, so it starts doing something else. And that is part of the bane of democracy that we have. There's no continuity in planning and development. And so it's something that we need to, to deal with. If we can have a priority investment program that is accepted by all political stakeholders, and we say that over the next 10 years, these are the investment projects in infrastructure we want to see, then it means that whether any government comes or goes, that uh, pro program continues. It's something that we can put on the table. Um, she says, why we have so much sunlight, why are we not using more solar? Um, it's um, possible to use solar now because the prices have come down. Before, solar was very expensive. And um, of course, in the night when the sun is not shining, uh, you don't have as much power. And so that was a hindrance to deploying solar. But now, with the falling prices of solar, we have two systems off-grid where we're allowing companies to go to communities that are far from the transmission grid to use solar solutions for them. These are communities that have very low power factors. They have a single TV set. They have a light bulb so that the children can do their homework at night. They have a small fridge or something. And so it's possible to put a solar panel on their roof and provide them with power. Now you can link it to a prepaid unit and so they buy the uh, credit like they buy for their phones, and they just input the number, and it switches on the power for them. So there are a lot of possibilities with that now. There are also hybrid systems where we're encouraging house owners to put solar uh, onto their residences and link it to the national grid. And so in the afternoon, when the sun is shining brightly and more solar is being generated, it cuts down the amount of power you take from the national grid. And then in the night, the national grid takes over. And so it reduces your electricity bill. And a lot of people are realizing that and are beginning to go for that uh, option. So it's becoming fashionable. And I'm sure that it will continue to, to increase. Um, accountability, this is what I talked about. Accountability should not be post-regime accountability, that you hide your grafts and corruption and you refuse to investigate it and only wait till you've left for the next government to come and do it. And so in our time, we started to prosecute you know, any cases that came up. Indeed, one of uh, the members of parliament on my side, belonging to my party, is in jail for 
um, uh, some malfeasance that took place. It went to court and uh, he was jailed. Uh, and so I believe that if any, if you're president and issues of corruption come up, you must deal with them. Uh, there are some presidents, and there was one of our previous presidents who said that um, he would not investigate corruption and bring down his government because it is believed that uh, the more you expose and investigate corruption, the more the perception that your government and yourself are corrupt. But it's like sweeping every day and sweeping the debt under your carpet. I mean, one day you will hardly be able to walk on it because all the debt on the carpet will make it so bumpy. And so it's better to clean it out and um, persevere in doing that and we'll continue to do so. Um, we talked about dark days for the media. And I'm sure he's referring to the incident that happened uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, where two radio stations were closed down. Um, Pro-opposition radio stations. I mean, armed policemen were sent there and shut down the radio stations, ostensibly because they had not renewed their licenses. And it happened at a time when the opposition was doing a major press conference, and these stations were carrying the press conference live. And so at that moment, the radio stations were attacked and closed down. And when the authorities who closed it down were asked, they said, oh, it had nothing to do with the press conference. It was just a coincidence that they were shut down at the time the press conference was taking place. But I believe that the role of a regulator is to build, not to destroy. And so if they haven't renewed their licenses, it's your duty to remind them you haven't renewed your licenses. And eventually you must even give them notice and give them a deadline, say if you don't renew it by this date, we'll shut you down. If you've done all that and the correspondence is available and you show it to anybody, people will understand. But then the point is there are more than 300 radio stations in, in, in Ghana. Why those two? <laughs> And those are the leading opposition stations. And so you definitely, I mean, you don't need to be uh, a clairvoyant to know that, I mean, definitely there were political reasons behind the closure of those stations. And so um, it's unfortunate. Um, the president has prided himself in being a human rights campaigner. And I don't think that things like this should be happening under uh, his watch. Um, quickly, winner takes all. It's related to democratic systems, like I said. Um, often, if you have a parliamentary system where you have to build coalitions to be able to govern, then it means that when you build a coalition, um, all the parties in the coalition take part. But we have a presidential system where it's first part the post. And if one party wins, I mean, they have absolute monopoly for four years. And so you have to cool your heels and wait and hope that the electorate will smile on you at the next election. And um, when you have two dominant parties, um, the partisanship becomes a bit extreme. And so it makes it difficult for people on the other side of the divide to accept appointments, even if they were offered by the uh, incumbent side. And so those are some of the problems we face. If you have a dominant party and weaker parties, then it probably makes it a, an easier option. But um, for now, that's the system we have. Um, I cannot comment on the Nigerian elections because I was not an observer there and everything I've read is in the media and I, I'm a social media buff. A lot of stories there are fake. I don't know if they are true. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to make any judgment based on what I've read on the social media. But uh, we saw all kinds of uh, things. Um, they showed pictures of soldiers walking into polling stations and uh, taking ballot boxes and things. I don't know if they are true. And so I don't want to hazard any uh, opinion. I hear the matter is in court. And so let's let the justices uh, uh, sift through the evidence and decide what, what needs to be done. Um, incumbency and cost of elections. In, in, they, they used to say incumbency advantage. But there's also an incumbency disadvantage. You know, you run the economy. You run the country. You know what is possible and what is not possible. Your opposition can be very reckless, like I saw in 2016. They promised heaven, you know, and say, so when we come, we'll build a factory in every district. We'll build a dam in every village. We'll give every constituency $1 million every year. I mean, I manage the economy. I can't make that kind of promise. And so I said, oh, they're lying. They can't do it, you know. But it sounds sweet in the ear. And so, of course, you get voted out. And um, what can you do? You just uh, hope that people will see through 
And so now people are asking, where are the factories? And people are asking, where are the uh, dams? Where's the one billion dollars, you know? And um, that is, it's a democratic learning experience for us. So incumbency has its advantages. I mean, as president, you are the, um, your, your person is the responsibility of the state to protect you. And so you have to ride in a government car. You must have all these police and soldiers guarding you and all that. And so somebody might enjoy it and say it's an, it's an advantage. And uh, the state fuels the vehicles and all that. But on the other side too, I mean, people in Africa, our people are in a hurry. And in a year or two, they don't see much happening. They start to make, make up their minds. I had a particularly difficult period. We had an energy crisis. I had to pay attention to try and resolve it, managed to resolve it by the end of 2015. So 2016, power stabilized. I had um, uh, an economy that had a wage spiral. 73% of total tax revenues was going into paying 600,000 public sector workers. That's the economy I inherited. And so I needed to do reforms to change that. By the time I left office, we had brought that down to about 53%. And so it freed up other resources to be able to do some of the infrastructure development that we did. You know, so those things are not, you're not able to turn around and make it visible in a four year period uh, for people to understand. What will I do differently? I'll communicate better. I mean, we need to let the people understand what the reality is. And so I think that we assumed that people knew what we were doing. And so we did not take our case to the people the way we should have. And so I believe I'll make myself more available to the media. I'll try and explain you know, what I'm trying to achieve. And I mean, if the people buy in, I think they'll understand. Um, cost of elections. and see how we can cut down the cost. If you look at the cost per voter, in terms of how much we spend on elections, it's much higher than many places uh, in Asia and South America and others. And so I know that the ECOWAS and the other sub-regional bodies are doing an analysis of cost of elections and seeing how our electoral commissions can bring down these costs so that it makes democracy cheaper. I mean, in our final year, that's one of what affected our budget because we're doing an IMF program. And IMF did not allow us to make any provision for running elections that year. And then we're slapped with like 1.7 billion uh, budget for elections alone. And so it dislocated the you know, budget that we had prepared and then pushed the deficit higher than we, we had anticipated. So these, these are things that we need to look at. Um, in Gambia, the elections had been declared and Yajame had accepted and called his opponent and congratulated him. And then a week later, he says, no, I don't concede. <laughs> and um, I won't go. I will contest the elections. So the sub-regional body set up a mission. And I was part of that mission to go and persuade him. And um, he was comp totally adamant. Whatever we said, he uh, refused to accept. And so we did two missions into the Gambia, and um, he didn't accept to um, concede the election. And so there was an ECOWAS uh, meeting. Uh, what happens is, when I talked about non-indifference uh, based on the EU charter and what happens in other countries, the check on it is that you must have a mandate. You cannot just go in. The sub-regional body or the continental body must give you a mandate that allows you to go in. And so that mandate was secured. And then Senegalese troops and Ghanaian troops were asked to go in and enforce the will of the people. Um, luckily, they went in. They camped on the uh, outskirts of Banjul. And then um, negotiation continued. We withdrew, we those who were on the earlier team. And then um, uh, President Alpha Conde and the president of Mauritania, who are close to Yajame, were asked to go and finished the final negotiation. And they negotiated, and he decided to go into exile. There was something funny that happened. Uh, on one of the trips, we took the president-elect out because he expressed um, uh, fear for his life. And um, we <laughs> he had complained of uh, the soldiers harassing him. 
And so we went to the president, you know, to explain to him that, you know, the president-elect was in fear for his life and that soldiers had surrounded his house. Then he said, oh, well, I know you, this international community, if even he, a fly, you know, settles on him, you say, I caused it. And so I need, I need to protect him to make sure nothing happens to him <laughs> because you blame me. And then I said, but Mr. President, um, the soldiers, I mean, if they were protecting him, they'll be facing the opposite direction. But the soldiers' guns were facing the man's house. And <laughs> instead of facing anybody coming to harm the man, the soldiers were rather, you know, face. When he opens any window, he sees guns pointing at him, you know. And so, I mean, that's part of, you know, what happens. But we're, we're happy it was resolved. And um, we hope that Gambia would continue uh, to be stable and democratic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we actually have gone beyond our time, but I, let me, on behalf of the uh, Said Business School and the uh, African Studies Center and the Africa Business Alliance, thank uh, Mr. President for coming here. Um, there's something that I think uh, it's important for us to emphasize. Last year, uh, the African Society, that's a group of African students in Oxford, hosted uh, the current president. So we are hosting the past president and perhaps future president again, which is an expression of our fairness in the next election in Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Your neutrality. <laughs> <laughs> so um, on behalf of the Said Business School and the African Story Center, I want to present this gift to Mr. President. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I please ask you to remain in the hall as we lead the president out? Uh, and please, for one more time, let's uh, give a round of applause to the president. <laughs>